and Rudolf Brun is on the phone. He designed and co-taught the course titled Religion and Science, and he presented at national and international conventions on Christianity, art, and evolution. He published in interdisciplinary journals such as Communio, I don't know what that is, Zygon, he's going to explain. He has been a professor of biology at the University of Geneva, Indiana State University, and Texas Christian University. And where is he calling it from? Switzerland. From Switzerland. Uh, Science, Art, and Christianity is his book. If you're looking at the podcast, that's the cover right there. Um, Contribution to a Theology of Nature for Our Time. Dr. Rudolf Brun, good morning, sir. How are you? <laughs> good morning, everybody. Well, I'm very well. Thank you for asking. How about you? I'm okay. How's the weather in Switzerland? Oh, well, it was pretty hot. Uh, you know, uh, we occasionally try to escape from the heat in Texas because that there that's where we live and went to Switzerland. And you don't know how hot it was. It was pretty close to the temperatures in, te- in Texas, but there is no air conditioning. <laughs> wow, wow. Oh, my gosh. And, and, and why? Why is it so hot? Well, I don't really know that answer, you know. I'm an ignoramus. And uh, I, I'm, I'm joining the club you might be in also, Larry, namely not knowing the answers to lots of things. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, me neither. I don't even know what's for lunch. <laughs> you're, you're, you're past lunch already. You're getting close to dinner time, aren't you? <laughs> well, um, it is actually a little bit, it's about uh, 4.30, 4, 4, 4.40, something of that sort at, at our place. And that is p.m. Let's talk about some of the big questions. Well, first of all, let me ask you this. Does the book attempt to answer the big questions? Well, I'm not quite sure whether I can answer big questions. I can try to approach them a little bit from a perspective that kind of developed into my brain in my brain over the years. And that brain was exposed to quite a few things Uh, primarily to biology, Uh, but while I grew up as a biologist in Basel, Switzerland, I also got to know very well a theologian by the name of Hans Urs von Balthasar. He is quite, yeah, he's quite well known in 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 Europe, maybe a little bit less in the United States. But uh, basically, I was influenced, I think, very heavily by this particular person. And the precise influence was that he was thinking along the Gestalt phenomenon. That is, the Gestalt phenomenon, in simple words, is the phenomenon that the, that the whole, namely the WHOL, is more than its parts and more than its parts, not only quantitatively, but also qualitatively, you see. This, this was also the main topic in Adolf Portman, my biology professor's work. And so this is why the Gestalt phenomenon is the phenomenon that united in my brain a little bit, uh, science and uh, Christian theology. Are, are we as humans able to perceive everything oh i'm not sure about that you know perceiving everything is a little bit lots demanding but yeah but what is what's surprising is that our brain is capable of discovering the outside world pretty good i mean we might Yeah. yeah you know we our brain makes models of the outside world and most of these models that are important for everyday life are pretty accurate okay and and the most yeah okay go ahead well i was just gonna say the reason i asked the question is because there's a there's a I'm not a great Bible scholar, so I'm going to mess this up, but there's a thing in Christianity, I think, or maybe in Judaism or somewhere, where it says the peace which surpasses, what is it, surpasses or whatever, all understanding. So so there's a, there's something in the Bible that suggests that we don't have the capacity to understand everything. It's, it goes beyond us. 
Well, um, I think uh, you're talking perhaps about trying to get closer to God, that is, trying to get closer to the understanding of God. And, and, and there, uh, I, I really think one, one has to be very careful uh, by uh, trying to um, say, well, I do this, understand, because when you know or when you think you understand God, then you can be certain that you do not understand God. <laughs> from our mind and our mind takes over from our heart, how can we make sure that they're in harmony with each other? Oh, wow. Well, you see, as I see it, the, the, the heart is really the center of our being. I mean, of course, it's not the physiological heart, but it's, it's not the brain either, I don't think. Uh, it, it, it goes deeper than that. Uh, our, our center, the center of a human being, the very center of the center of a human is somewhere else than in that human himself or herself. Let me explain. Uh, you see, uh, Saint Augustine said it really very beautifully. He, 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 in, he said that you, O oh God, are deeper in me than I am myself, okay? And what, what, what I think it's possible to discover is that this can be seen in a modern, even in a, in a, in a, in a science worldview context, right? So our, our, our heart is really that which is related to transcendence. That is, it is related to that which is beyond ourselves. And so if we go, and if we go into ourselves meditating and getting, trying closer to God, but what we are finding out is that we do really have a root that is going, that is going to the that is going to the, do creation and because god and because creation is created by god we do have a way back to god through creation you know uh, in, in looking at all of god's creation the plants the animals and us it seems like we human beings are the only ones that also are creative and, 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 I, and your book is, deals with art also. So is there a scientific explanation as to why or what the need is for us to be creative, whether it's in the arts or, or in any other way? Well, you see, nature is creative, okay? Nature is creative by being capable of unifying what it has created already into something new. That might be a little bit uh, you know, difficult to understand, but nature is capable of synthesis. Nature is capable of unifying things into novelty. Right? I mean, it, the, 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 the elementary particles of atoms, you know, that nature is capable of unifying these particles into atoms. And atoms are capable of being unified into molecules, and molecules into life, and life into mind, this sort of thing. So nature is capable of being creative. And since we are part of nature, we can be yeah. creative also. to be creative in that regard sounds like intelligent design to me. How could that happen accidentally? Well, <clears throat> the design question is, uh, of course, an important one. I, 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 really, I really think that, that it is. What we also have to take into consideration, however, is if we look at the world the scientific way, then what we see is that the world obeys the laws of statistics, right? I mean, statistics, probability is one of the mathematical frameworks that is at the root of creation. 
Now, design, you know, if, di if design means that the world is oriented towards a specific goal, then that might be true, but it is oriented toward a specific goal, not excluding probability, not excluding statistics. Well, one of the laws of science, correct me if I'm wrong, you're the expert, one of the laws of science is that uh, water, for example, uh, travels the path of least resistance, and, and, and pretty much everything travels the path of least resistance, correct? Well, as long as there is no energy around to, pres to, to kind of uh, get the opposite way. See, when, when you have when you have uh, um, when you have entities that take up energy right then these entities cannot quite be understood by simply saying everything goes downhill right there is thing that there are saying not only things but the entire universe kind of goes uphill and why is that it is because there is a tremendous amount of energy in the universe that kind of is rooted in the Big Bang, exp Big Bang explosion that is capable of getting this synthesis going I was speaking about earlier. Right, right, right. See, this is the part that I, I've always wondered about. If everything starts with a Big Bang, uh, and then somehow fast forward to life itself, just to, just to kind of move ahead with the conversation. Um, all of a sudden, there's on this planet, there's one single cell of life, and then there's two single cells. And they're always like an amoeba uh, splitting um, and becoming another one, correct? Isn't that what happened? Yeah, that's essentially is that life is capable of uh, um, producing more life. Yeah, yeah, that okay, is. Right. Yes. So what happened along the way that that required since since life could reproduce itself? What happened along the way to require two sexes? Why did that happen? Why is it pos Why is it necessary for two sexes? Why couldn't we just be reproducing? Like, why couldn't I say, okay, ready for the... I'm going to split and get a son. Here he is. <laughs> why couldn't we do that? Well, that's a very good question and a difficulty and a difficult one also. But uh, let me just uh, um, uh, say, uh, uh, commenting that in amoeba, for example, or in a bacteria or so, uh, there might be more sexes than just two, okay? There might be four, for example, uh, you know? So it's not absolutely necessary that there are two sexes for propagating life. There are also organisms that can propagate all by themselves. They don't need females, can, don't, need, don't need males, for example, and in right. lizards or so. So that's parthenogenesis, okay? Now, why that is that sex emerged in evolution is um, a rather complicated question, but it has to do with, with genes that are different in males and females. And if if these genes uh, these genes are kind of remodeled and are kind of reshuffled in males and females, and if you have fertilization, then you have by each fertilization basically a organism the 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 genes of which never ever have existed in that configuration before, right? So in in other words, sex makes each individual specifically, each individual specific, that is, uh, each individual is a, is, a, is a construct of nature in human terms to see how well it works, you know, competing with other such individuals. Right, right. And so the survival then of that one, which is best fitted, where we had the most, uh, the genes that are best adapted to the particular say, uh, situation that organisms finding itself into, that will propagate more than the others, you know? And this is why sex is so important because it, it, it gives survival chances in a, in a statistical way to a wide yeah, group yeah. of individuals. Right, and that, what you just 
said right there is so fascinating because in order for that to happen, there must have been some way that the organisms knew that they needed to have some information from two different parts in order to evolve. They're, 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 they're a single cell animal wouldn't evolve. Only, a, only, a, only an organism that requires two sexes could possibly evolve. And if that was true, then you would have to have, again, it goes back to evidence of uh, intelligent design. How could that happen by itself? Well, um, you know, even if you do not have two sexes, if, if an organism is propagating itself without, a, without, an opposite, without an opposite sex, you still can have mutations because when genes are copied, then mutations might have by mistake, okay? And uh, it, it, in other words, you can have evolution because there is there is um, uh, that by 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 splitting apart one organism splitting apart into two the two might not be identical because there are mutations that might happen so you don't need you you don't really need obligatory two sexes two sexes help the process but if you, one can imagine that one organism all by itself is capable of propagating and its offspring then producing replication errors so that uh, there is variation. That is the key. You need to have variation as, as yeah, life yeah. emerges so that yeah. natural selection can select the best fitted individual. Dr. Brun, I, I've read many articles that, or not many, but I've read some articles that say that sperm and uh, ovaries have memory. So, so the, a, a woman's ovaries have a memory of what that woman has gone through in her life, and a man's sperm have memories. This is, is a, this is a very interesting topic. Whether I don't know if it's true or not, but this is what the article says. So, if if my memories get together with my wife's memories and produce a child who becomes a little bit better than both of us. That's a, a, little, a little micro evolution, isn't it? Yeah, but I have to disappoint you a little bit from a scientific perspective and especially from a geneticist perspective, you know, sperms and eggs do not have memories of what has happened to the person that produced sperms or eggs, right? That's a Lamarckian idea uh, and that uh, has been around uh, for a while, but I think uh, as a scientist, I have to say we have eliminated that possibility so far. Um, let me just reintroduce you. Rudolf Brunner is our guest. His book is called Science, Art, and Christianity. What a fabulous conversation we're having with Dr. Brun over in Switzerland, <laughs> where it's as hot as Florida right now, right? <laughs> Um, I, I have to bring up uh, the music part uh, because you had brought up music in your book as saying that uh, to have music is to be the closest you can to God. Uh, Larry and I have a friend that was brought up in eastern Germany when the wall was still up. And then when the wall came down, uh, she was able to go to church and learn about God and Jesus. And the best way she learned about Jesus and God was through songs. She joined the choir, and uh, those songs really made an impact on her. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, music, uh, music, reflects, music reflects the way the universe is built. And the universe is built from the word of God that created it. And so music reflects the construction of the universe. And I can elaborate on what I, what I mean by that. You see, music emerges from uh, putting notes into melodies and melodies into songs or symphonies or whatnot. See, 
These are elements that are synthesized into new things, just like in nature, whereby you also have material that's already here being synthesized in something totally new. And in music, you can actually listen to this process. You can, you can sing, you know, yourself alone, or you can sing into a choir, in, in a choir, or you can sing in polyphony, and there you experience, you really do experience the architecture by which the world is built, namely that unifying diversity brings forth beauty, and beauty, re, beauty makes the soul resonate because deep in ourselves we have that word of God that created creation also. And so we have a very good, wonderful contact by, by being musicians or, 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 or singing or making music. You know, that gets, us, that gets us closer to the construction of the universe and gets us closer to the word of God that created it. Wow, that's fascinating what you just said. So it, it, Christianity promises eternal life. Is, is eternal life um, scientifically, uh, I mean, what, is, what does science say about the, the possibility that we live eternally in another realm? <laughs> well, I think that might be a little bit beyond science, you know. Uh, science <laughs> produces hypotheses and then science needs to test those hypotheses. So far, I cannot think of a test for whether or not eternity exists, which really doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. <laughs> for being on our show today. I loved this conversation. The book is available on Amazon. Do you have a different website you want to recommend? Well, I can have it in Apple Books. It's available there. It's available on my webpage, which is uh, churchandscience.squarespace.com. And it's also available at, uh, at uh, Google Books. And, uh, well, that's, that's where you can buy the thing if you wanted to. Uh, I, I really would appreciate it because I put a lot of time into that and I do not even want to talk about the money I did put into that. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mo, it's an honor to have you on our show, Doctor. Thank you for being on the show. Again, the book is called Science, Art, and Christianity and it is written by Rudolf Brun. Uh, Rudolf, thank you so much for taking time to be with us today. Stay, stay cool over there in hot, hot Switzerland. <laughs> Robin, Larry, thank you very much for having me. It was a wonderful time for all of us. Thank oh you. My gosh. Oh, we had yeah. a great time. Oh, my gosh, it was great. I wish you could have been in the studio. Thank you, sir. All right, we'll be right back. Oh.